Welcome, folks. We'll just let others trickle in here in the next few minutes and we'll go ahead and get started. A few seconds, I should say. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started if we want to go to the next slide. Welcome, everybody, to the 2022 Better Building Summer Webinar Series. We're dedicated to bringing you the latest actionable insights from leading industry experts. And this annual series is a chance to explore topics, trends, and technologies that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate energy efficiency adoption. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solution Center. We'll follow up when that recording and the slides are made available. Next, attendees are in listen-only mode, which means that microphones have been muted. But if you do experience any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, please go ahead and send a message in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. Next slide. My name is Bree Colon, and I serve as a fellow in the Building Technologies Office. Within Better Buildings, I support as the sector lead for higher education, as well as retail, food service, and grocery. Next slide. And I wanted to start off here today by setting the scene and introducing, first off, the institution that our speakers are coming here from um, and share some high-level sustainability accolades coming from UC Irvine. So UC Irvine has been doing deep energy efficiency starting since the early 90s, and they've really built on this expertise and experimentation over the years. Attitude has played a significant role in their work and it's demonstrated in their willingness to set bold goals and rise to the occasion to meet them. To do this work, they have altered priorities when spending their budget, often without experiencing budget increases. They are one of the leading global institutions in their delivery of lead platinum buildings. Um, and as costs of offsets and recs increase in the market, their model is fundamental to learn from to implement deep energy efficiency measures and reduce overall emissions. So organizations across sectors can really learn from these best practices and take, uh, take them back to their organizations in their unique contexts to implement. And finally, UC Irvine is a Better Buildings Challenge goal achiever. They achieved this back in 2014, which was seven years ahead of time from their projected uh, goal year date. So overachievers and they're walking the walk in their work. They were recognized at that time by President Obama, and we were excited to share with them in that experience. Next slide. Next up, we can transition to our interactive platform that we'll be utilizing for Q&A, polling, and feedback. So if folks could go to slido.com on their mobile devices or by opening a new window in their internet browser, today's event code is hashtag or pound DOE. And if you'd like to ask panelists questions throughout the webinar, you could submit them there and we'll look towards those questions and answer them at the end of the session. You're able to select the thumbs up icons for questions that you like to upvote them, and that'll rise to the top for those most popular questions to be addressed by speakers. Next slide. So to start off, we would love to introduce our first poll here. So if folks could join us over at Slido and respond to our initial question. If you do have any issues, again, please message our tech support team in the Zoom Q&A function. And we want to know first just where others are coming from in our virtual audience. It's helpful for us to get a lay of a land as well as for our speakers to understand uh, in advance of their presentation. So I'm seeing a good representation from consultants, higher education, not surprise. Um, see that great representation there, local government, industrial nonprofit, all the bars are moving. This is so exciting, and we're thrilled to have you all here with us today. We'll let we'll let those numbers level out here in the next couple seconds or so. Thank you for engaging again in this poll. Um, this is really great and rich information. All right, we're off to the races. That looks like they're leveling off here. Perfect. Great. 
Thank you. I think we can go to the next slide and feel free to keep inputting that information in that poll. And that's been a great kind of intro to our platform that we'll utilize. And next up, I'm happy to introduce our presenters today and turn it over to them to talk more about how they've implemented energy efficiency at UC Irvine. So first off, we have uh, Wendell Bracey. Wendell is the University of California Irvine's Associate Chancellor for Sustainability. In this role, uh, he leads efforts by UC Irvine and assists other campuses throughout the UC system to implement UC's carbon neutrality initiative. Bracey is the chair of the Energy Services Pillar for the University of California's Global Climate Leadership Council. And for 25 years, he provided leadership for an award-winning sustainability program in his role as Vice Chancellor for Administrative and Business Services. And next, we're joined by Brian Pratt. Brian is the Campus Architect and Associate Vice Chancellor for Design and Construction Services at the University of California, Irvine. Currently, he oversees all major academic building projects and leads the design and construction efforts for the campus, delivering highly complex projects via design build. In his more than eight year tenure at UC Irvine, he's overseen several project types, including research facilities, laboratories, active learning classrooms, dormitories, and highly technical projects. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Wendell and Brian. I will turn it over to you all and you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Bree. Um, the first thing I wanna say is um, uh, why we're doing this. UC Irvine's mission is to develop and to share climate solutions that can extend well beyond the campus and beyond California as well. And uh, I might just correct one little detail that you, you mentioned, Bree, uh, which is, uh, I think you said we seldom had to seek budget augmentations or extra support, financial support for this program. Uh, that wasn't quite right. We never have gotten one extra dollar in any budget in order to support the entire program that, that Brian and I are gonna talk about today. It was entirely self-funded. Uh, by uh, changing priorities and by uh, having extremely good financial returns. And, and um, so I, I wanna make that clear because that is a key pillar of this program. Uh, now, sometimes when I present uh, what has worked for UC Irvine, uh, skeptics, uh, and I, this is a reasonable skepticism to have, uh, they assume, well, maybe it's easier in California. We have a mild climate, we have uh, relatively higher energy costs, Maybe that's why we can make deep energy efficiency pay for itself. Now, I'm not gonna answer this question right now, but I promise to circle back at this, on this point in my closing remarks. First of all, let me say, now is when deep energy efficiency is suddenly more important than ever. Next slide, please. The first problem that concerns us is the risk of thermal overshoot. Uh, I know many climate scientists who are fearful that just with the uh, uh, greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere, we may be on a path on this planet to blow right past 1.5 degrees centigrade. And there's also a lot of concern about whether the massive number of commitments made in COP26 or, or following it uh, will be met. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, there is uncertainty about whether global cooperation will be undermined by international conflicts. Um, next slide. Uh, this is one of the many headlines you may have seen. Uh, the optimistic view is, well, Europe looks like it's on a path to uh, decarbonized uh, energy systems because of energy independence being uh, an important priority. So, that may happen. On the other hand, uh, there are as many pessimistic uh, uh, forecasts about the impact of the war on uh, uh, global climate uh, emissions. Next uh, slide, please. Now, why are universities and institutions turning away from procurement of emissions attributes, meaning RECs or offsets? Uh, now, when you look at the massive increase in net zero goals and commitments post uh, COP26 and some a few of them before COP26, 
Um, the word net usually means outsourcing the problem. It means procuring RECs and offsets in, in a global market. And uh, this massive increase means that every offset and REC in the global market will be sold at a market clearing price. Uh, that's just economics 101. We can see from the way prices are going, the demand is there. It's coming from lots of corporations who have the money and the commitment to spend it on, on offsets or, or RECs. Now, this is not a theory. Offset prices have quadrupled in, in the last year. And here's a, a, a troubling point that, that is starting to concern a lot of people. Entering a market which is demand saturated yields no additionality. That's the cardinal principle of offset efficacy. And it's really undermined by the fact that a quadrupling of prices means every offset is gonna be sold. There's no additionality in entering a market like that. Now, by contrast, deep energy efficiency has massive advantages, and we're gonna talk about those. Next slide, please. So this slide is about owning the problem instead of outsourcing it. Uh, the solution here is essentially permanent. It costs far less. In fact, it pays for itself. It's directly measurable, directly. And it's what we learned in elementary school. And it's what we learned from our mothers. Use less. That's the first principle. And uh, the, the, the problem of uh, accounting is that uh, a lot of what's called uh, carbon accounting is really kilowatt hour accounting, which is conveniently overlooking what the carbon content was of every kilowatt hour at the point of production. So there's some problems that are overcome by deep energy efficiency. Next slide, please. We'll get down to basics here in a minute. Um, hang on a second. Now let's focus on what used to be a scary question. How do we pay for deep energy efficiency? Uh, this photograph uh, is an aerial of the academic core of the UC Irvine campus. And uh, um, there's some good news about deep energy efficiency. Let, let me uh, just cover it at a high level. Uh, first of all, deep is deeper than we ever anticipated or hoped for when we started this, uh, uh, this journey back a couple of uh, decades ago. Uh, let me explain how, how we measure performance improvement. For retrofits, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we measure before and after energy uh, use. So it's, uh, it's, it's a direct measurement. Now for new construction, we have to have a baseline uh, against which to compare. So for new construction, outperforming California's Title 24, the energy code in California, which is considered one of the toughest energy codes in the United States, the extent to which we outperform Title 24 is what we count as savings. Um, now, uh, we will detail uh, a little bit in a few minutes how we, our deep energy efficiency program pays for itself. Uh, and, and as I do that, I want you to keep in mind, this is not about a one-shot project where we got lucky, but rather a 25-year program extending across the entire UC campus that you see on the slide right here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is just to use as an example, uh, one of our smaller lecture halls uh, on campus. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about uh, why is it technically possible to attain 50% energy efficiency improvements in new and retrofitted buildings across an entire campus. And that's what we call deep energy efficiency, 50% or better improvement. So when you think back about how mechanical systems have been designed in buildings, um, the last half of the 20th century for 50 years, building mechanical systems employed worst case design assumptions in order to provide a margin of safety for healthful ventilation, for exhaust, for adequate fresh air intake and for occupant comfort. Now, what do I mean by worst case? Okay, this is an example. Uh, you see uh, the um, typical sign in a lecture hall on campus. Uh, it says the maximum occupancy. That's partly there because it's uh, part of the fire marshal's uh, responsibility to post that. But it's also a perfect example 
uh, uh, of something that was used as the uh, a design parameter when this, uh, this lecture hall was uh, designed and built. The typical code requirement is 15 cubic feet of outside air per minute per presumed maximum occupant. Presumed maximum occupant. Now, that's the key part of this. The same example applies to other large assembly spaces on campuses, uh, such as dining halls, food courts, auditoria, indoor athletic facilities, arts teaching studios, offices, all classrooms of all sizes. And, and um, so it's always assumed by the, uh, the design uh, worst case parameter that those are always full all the time every seat filled. Well, that's not, not true at all. You can, you can just think about all those things I just mentioned, and they have highly variable rates of occupancy. Now, in labs, the worst case assumption is a little bit different. Their uh, ventilation and exhaust in laboratories is to remove the hazard, airborne hazards. And the, the worst case assumption in the case of a lab is that there's presence of airborne hazards at all times. Uh, so before sensors and smart informatics enable precision control and real-time sensing and the assurance of system performance, overdesign of HVAC actually did make sense. No longer, however. Precision control is just the right amount of energy being applied at just the right place at just the right time. Next slide, please. In 1992, we set the goal of outperforming Title 24 by 20% for new buildings in order to close an accumulated utilities budget deficit. Uh, it didn't really have much at that point to do with uh, uh, sustainability or carbon reduction. Uh, we had a budget deficit, so we set this goal, beating Title 24, because the campus was growing, so we thought uh, as, as we built new buildings that uh, outperformed Title 24, we would uh, catch up on, on and, and uh, recover that deficit that they accumulated. Uh, we also adopted a tool, and we call it a tool because this isn't a document that sits on the shelf. It's called the Life Cycle and Sustainability Performance Standards. Here's a picture of it. Uh, this tool does not sit on the shelf unnoticed. It's been used for almost three decades, revised just two times, each re revision making it slightly more rigorous. Uh, Brian will show you key standards from this document uh, in just a few minutes uh, later in this discussion. And by the way, this is available to anyone. Uh, it's open source as far as we're concerned. We will share uh, with anyone. Next slide, please. <coughs> Why can't I get this to move? Sorry, we have a technical problem here we're fixing right now. Okay, okay, uh, going forward in time, I, I started with 1992. In 1993, we started to experiment in this project, uh, which is a, a complex of four um, social sciences uh, buildings. Um, we experimented using real-time CO2 sensing in 1993 to regulate the introduction of relief air, outside air, into the, to the recirculating air system. Uh, in 1995, we raised the goal of outperforming Title 24 from 20% to 30%, which seemed feasible because 20% had, had proven entirely feasible. Uh, that utilities deficit I mentioned a few minutes ago was fully recovered by about 1996. Um, going forward, in 2001, we set the goal of lead silver for all new construction. And, and by the way, the campus has grown during the, the entire period of, uh, that I'm, I'm discussing now for the past uh, three decades. In 2004, we set the goal of lead gold for new construction. In 2008, we set the goal of lead platinum for new construction. Now, those of you who know about uh, the lead platinum uh, requirements know that it's virtually impossible because of the way the, the uh, uh, criteria are weighted, virtually impossible to attain lead platinum without performing Title 24 by 50%. Then in 2009, we focused more intently on laboratories. We, foc we turned toward laboratories because on our campus, we noticed, I noticed uh, initially that 20% of uh, uh, campus space was laboratory space. 
but it was consuming 65% of campus energy. I was so concerned about this, these numbers. I looked into uh, a couple of big 10 universities. I looked into a, a, a couple of big uh, research uh, universities in the United Kingdom. Uh, I looked into uh, uh, some uh, big research universities in the Northeast part of the United States and found this pattern was actually consistent across all the research universities that I looked at. So um, it wasn't that we were an oddball. We, we needed to look at this though. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2010, UC Irvine was the first U.S. university to employ the new AirQuity system for real-time air quality sensing in laboratories. Our first installation was in this building, the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Laboratory, which, because of this new innovation, outperformed Title 24 by 50.3%. In 2010, we then adopted the goal of outperforming Title 24 by at least 50% for all new construction, all new construction, not just laboratories. Now, the one exception to all is actually medical care facilities, and uh, those are on a separate campus uh, in the case of uh, UC Irvine, um, but uh, there are rigid codes in um, uh, medical care facilities uh, that have to do with infection control. And, and um, uh, so the, uh, we have made some improvements in that area, but it's tougher to hit that 50% goal there. Next slide, please. This slide really needs no heading. And you can read uh, what the, the president himself said uh, when we attained the 2020 goal that President Obama had set in the Better Buildings Challenge seven years early. I remember the roar that I heard from the crowd in uh, uh, the Angel Stadium when he said, it looks like, what did he say? UC Irvine went ahead and did it, uh, done. So UC Irvine is ahead of the curve. I'll never forget the sound of that, that uh, the audience response to that. Next slide, please. Let's see. So remember that slide showing the maximum occupancy in that lecture hall, uh, the design assumption being worst case condition at all times, that all seats were filled all the time uh, and, and it was operating around the clock. In a lecture hall, um, that, that is the, the premise that used to be made in the, in the latter half of the 20th century. Now in a laboratory, the implicit assumption was that unknown airborne hazards could be in the air that the lab might be occupied and that wind conditions outside required a high exhaust stack discharge airspeed. Uh, and the overarching implicit and seldom stated assumption is that more is better. Uh, now, you might wonder, do we think building systems engineers were careless or stupid? No, actually, that's not, not our, our belief at all. However, until real-time sensors and informatics were available, uh, that, was the, that was a reasonable design assumption for, for all types of buildings on a campus. Real-time sensing and informatics changed everything. Next slide, please. So why was 50% possible? Uh, first of all, uh, some people wonder, gee, maybe the reason Irvine achieved that kind of deep energy efficiency was because our buildings were so bad to begin with. Well, that's not true. They were all pretty new buildings. We're a young campus as, as uh, campuses go. And so all the buildings uh, that we were um, achieving deep energy efficiency by retrofitting had been built to California's Title 24 and, and maintained reasonably. Um, we challenged a lot of uh, common thinking, though. The, the idea that more is better, uh, the idea that waste had to be tolerated in order to provide that margin of safety. Um, and by the way, some, some of the things we did had nonlinear results. Uh, my favorite example is the exhaust fans that you see at the bottom of the stacks on every lab building on every campus and actually in any R&D center. Um, with those, um, with those exhaust fans, it follows the cube rule. So cutting the exhaust speed of the discharged air out of an exhaust stack in half cuts energy use by seven eighths. 
So there, there were some nonlinear things that really helped us out when we, when we got down to the nuts and bolts. Um, so um, <clears throat> slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Yeah, the message here is it's not all about technology. Now, um, I give the, the, this is just my way, of, uh, it's, it's half and half, but I, I kind of give the nod to attitude. And let me explain what I'm talking about. When I say engineering with an attitude. Um, the engineers uh, that we have on campus in facilities management and in, uh, for that matter, the, uh, the industrial hygienists we have in environmental health and safety, the consultants we work with, if you say to those people that such and such is a best practice or a standard practice, uh, uh, and they'll say, well, let's see the data. Let's take a look at the data. Now, that's exactly the kind of question that should be asked in a research university. Any research university will tell you that they uh, extol uh, evidence-based data as, as the support for uh, science and, and technology. So that, that's the right question. And so part of what, what developed as we did this deep energy efficiency program was, was what I call a new culture of precision control. And, and that's really important uh, uh, on, a, on a campus because it makes for a safer campus. And I'll come back to that point in, in a few minutes, but first I wanna pass this over to Brian. Thanks, Wendell. Next slide, please. So for new buildings, we changed our design objectives and stopped doing certain things that didn't support life cycle performance. And we gave a high priority to design features and standards that did support life cycle performance. So we stopped building buildings in the shape of a donut with wings. Uh, this is our 131,000 square foot science library. Uh, this was built in 1991. Uh, you, you'll notice that it has extensive surface area ratio of floor area to skin. Uh, rooftop mechanical ducts just laying on the roof. Um, there's a total disregard for solar orientation. Um, there are spaces that create wind tunnels and it's functionally deficient due to its narrow loft sizes um, for the nature of the spaces that um, it, it's used for. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, these are both east facades of this building and you can see a lack of solar control um, intense daylight, uh, direct sun streaming into the building. Um, once again, those, those wind tunnel spaces and um, disregard for solar orientation. Next slide, please. So we also stopped building buildings with unconventional materials and unusual detailing. This is McGaw Hall, one of our large wet lab research buildings uh, completed in 1991. Uh, this happens to use uh, a cladding that ended up being degradable in UV, um, no solar control other than the use of reflective glass, so um, tremendous solar heat gain. Um, leakage in the curtain walls, uh, there's a transition between fiberglass panels with no flashing, used caulking instead for about 46,000 linear feet of caulking on this building. Um, and even used an elaborate one quarter inch pipe drainage of sills and cladding in the airspace um, around the building. And this resulted in $1 million in deferred maintenance in the very first year. So what did we do? Next slide, please. Uh, we started building buildings that are more conventional and more responsive to um, passive uh, design, solar design, as well as active considerations. Um, so this is our continuing education building, a 75,000 square foot office and instructional building built in uh, 2016. Uh, the left hand image is, is a west facade and the right hand image is uh, a deeper area of that west facade. This building is basically shaped like a C and uh, it was shaped like that to maximize uh, north daylight, north access to daylight. Um, in the left hand image on the south facade, you can see um, very deep solar shading. Um, on the right hand image, you can see a PV solar array, array working as a shading device for the outdoor um, uh, patio gathering area. Uh, 
what we learned was that different um, uh, devices and different components of our buildings need to do double and triple duty. Um, this, this deep west facade under shade helps control that difficult west sun um, coming streaming in in the late afternoon hours. Um, but, but more importantly, it achieves really terrific natural north daylight. Next slide, please. So this is the Susan and Henry Samueli Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering Building. Um, we just finished this project. It's about 220,000 square feet of wet lab research, collaboration, and office space for the schools of engineering, information, computer sciences, and physical sciences. On the right-hand image, you can see the north facade of the laboratory bar. Um, this includes write-up stations along uh, the glass and uh, the wet laboratories spaced inward from there uh, that borrow light from, from the north facade. Um, the, in the background of this image, you can see the faculty office wing. And these are faculty offices separated from the laboratory areas um, with much less intensive mechanical requirements. Uh, the left-hand image is the south and west facades. And, and the south facade has support spaces for the laboratories, which require more wall space and enable us to use punched openings with physical sun control for controlling of solar heat gain. You'll notice the west facade has sawtooths with glass slots facing north to maximize daylight, but control that very difficult western sun. Uh, this project is 55.5% better than California's stringent Title 24 energy code. Um, it uses pre concrete precast panels and um, it has exceptional north natural light into the write-up and, and laboratories. And one thing I'd like to mention, through deep BIM coordination, um, we can basically BIM coordination modeling every single system in the building. It results in a lower floor to floor height, um, only for about 14 feet. And that's key because it doesn't initiate high rise code requirements that include intensive additive mechanical loads for pressurized stairs, et cetera. Um, in this left-hand image, you'll also notice an exterior stair that is uh, unconditioned space. Next slide, please. So as Wendell mentioned, we prepared this tool outlining the principles we apply to our major capital projects and renovations. Um, this is available through UCI Design and Construction Services website. And it tackles deep sustainability and life cycle standards and costs in the sections listed on the left. It's a pretty comprehensive take on the UCI design standards and costs. Um, this outlines things we are going to do and things we are not going to do. And the intention is for this tool to be actionable. Um, very important to us is that we try to focus on performance driven aspects rather than being prescriptive to allow for our designers and engineers to be innovate, more innovative and, and evolutionary. Our standards focused on such things as massive efficiencies, ratio of exterior skin to floor area, and other fundamental drivers of unit costs. And this process yielded savings that were intentionally channeled into life cycle standards in which energy and sustainability had the highest priority. The financial results of these practices are not a new, single new building has required a budget increase to fund our life cycle and sustainability performance standards. And we paid for these added costs by reallocating priorities and money as just outlined. And um, as Wendell mentioned and Bree mentioned, uh, we have over 21 lead platinum projects with several more in the queue. Next slide, please. So this table is an example of one of the tables in the, in the tool. And this runs through building mechanical systems and addresses issues like static pressure, temperature set points, and air changes. Now, as Wendell mentioned, the biggest impact is probably on labs. And we host a smart lab one and a half day seminar that provides a deep dive into the principles. Air acuity is used to monitor uh, real-time air quality results in modulated air changes for occupied and unoccupied labs based on real-time air quality measurements. It wraps up when air quality is lower, ramps down when air quality is satisfactory. It also has very aggressive laboratory light power densities and we add bench task lighting to satisfy bench light level requirements. We borrow daylight into the laboratories through interior glass 
um, for wellness, but also for uh, lower lighting intensities. Uh, this also talks about exhaust stack heights. Um, these are addressed too, mostly via wind study, but it also has height minimums above the roof. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, discusses management of solar heat gain. And this table runs through shading requirements based on solar orientation. And it requires aggressive shading requirements and high performance glass use to minimize uh, thermal heat gain. It's sensitive to solar orientation and physical sun control based on uh, the, the uh, facade orientation. So for example, the Southeast and West glass we're required to reduce direct sun impact 85 per, by 85%. And that um, uses uh, all kinds of devices, um, including tree canopies, adjacent buildings, um, building overhangs, recesses and fins, and so on. Um, so we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Next slide, please. So one more example is uh, this is a summary table outlining other strategies and payoffs and the redirection of savings into areas with more value. So for example, one related to big picture building organization of building functions is that idea of consolidating non-labs into adjoining uh, wings. Unconditioned outdoor stairs is another uh, means to save um, uh, massive energy um, uh, uh, quantities. Um, we use durable materials, long life, low maintenance. And interestingly enough, we, we strive to use no unconventional structure, seismic or foundation systems. And as an example, we don't allow moment frames on our campus buildings due to the investigation and repair requirements after a major seismic event here in California. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Wendell and uh, we'll go on from here. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, so let me summarize just a little in, in closing. Uh, Brian has outlined how realigning priorities within building construction budgets paid the entire cost of our life cycle and sustainability performance standards. Oh, next, next slide. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So uh, this is basic in some ways. I mean, some of the things Brian talked about uh, go all the way back to uh, uh, those ratios of uh, uh, length to width for buildings, uh, the ratio of floor area uh, to uh, surface area of the skin of a building. Um, things of that type are, are so basic, they're sometimes overlooked uh, in the design process. And when that happens, you get pretty far into the design before you can you can actually benefit from, from thinking through the basic ratios that drive a lot of the budget. And, and, and that, that's what happens when, when buildings get to a point in design where they can't do deep energy efficiency because the, the going in assumptions have been uh, kind of overlooked. So we don't do that. Um, and, and it's partly because it's, it's outlined in this tool that Brian and I uh, have worked on and and Brian works with it every day now uh, in in uh, designing new buildings for the campus. Now, um, so uh, what we did and the most important chart in a way, uh, and and I realize uh, what Brian showed you was just uh, pictures of the charts, uh, the key three key charts that came out of that uh, tool, the life cycle and sustainability performance tool. Um, we don't have time to go through all of those uh, item by item, but um, I'll, I'll uh, post in a second here uh, a workshop where we'll take a deeper dive on, on some of those things. Um, it's, it's important to, to note that the entire cost of our program was paid for just by making different choices, different decisions. And the most important table in, in a life cycle report like that, or a tool, I should call it a tool, not a report, is that that table that had two, two columns. Uh, on the left-hand side was all the things we're not going to do anymore because we're using the savings from not doing those things for the right-hand side, which is all life cycle and sustainability improvements. And that's how we get to deep energy efficiency and, um, uh, and uh, it's paid for entirely by this program. Now for retrofit projects, we use tax exempt bonds 
with a 15 year term. Now, uh, the way those bonds um, were, uh, uh, the, the way the financial planning went, the, the parameter was that in the first year of a retrofit project, uh, that is an energy retrofit projects, the savings had to be 1.15 times the, the, the debt uh, coverage uh, and, or in, in, uh, the debt requirement. In other words, there was a mortgage payment and we had to have a, um, a, a surplus on top of that, a margin of safety of 15%. Now, many of our projects, I think practically maybe all of them, had considerably more than 1.15 times debt coverage ratios. So it, it, they outperformed the, the financial requirement. And uh, these financing numbers are considered very solid. Uh, these ratios did not even include the co-benefits that could be monetized. And they turned out to be um, much more valuable than we ever thought. Uh, and incidentally, we, didn't, we never once even talked about years of payback for an energy efficiency project. Uh, that way of looking at projects as a way to uh, uh, not reach deep energy efficiency levels. Uh, you never saw a project that had a three-year payback that, that uh, achieved 50% savings. So we looked at, at the, the debt coverage requirement, uh, and, and that was a much more rational way to achieve deep results. Um, so uh, we're doing a... Uh, a, a, a conference at I2SL, pre-conference pre workshop. I2SL stands for International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. And it will cover in detail the economic value of all the co-benefits to which economic numbers can be assigned. Uh, that is uh, economic uh, co-benefits apart from energy savings in our Smart Labs program. And uh, it's fair to say, I think, that when co-benefits are taken into account, our life cycle performance and sustainability standards have yielded and continue to yield far greater savings than they cost the university. Now, keep in mind, this isn't a rosy theory. We now have three decades of evidence. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the link for the workshop I just mentioned. It will focus on laboratories, including detailed costs and benefits, including economic value of all the co-benefits uh, that can be assigned an economic value. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. We can't assign an economic value to the fact that our laboratories are safer now uh, because there's no way that I know of of putting a, a dollar value on uh, avoided human suffering or sickness of, of, that would come from an airborne hazard problem in a laboratory. Uh, but there are some things we can put economic values on, um, such as... Uh, air handlers and motors and, and uh, anything that uh, creates heat or movement in a building uh, will probably last four times as long because all of those things are running slower in, in buildings where the air changes are lower, the ventilation fan or the exhaust fans are running slower. Uh, those fans are not running as hot anymore. Air handlers are running cooler. Those things aren't gonna last twice as long. They'll probably last four times as long. And uh, so um, even though what we we're going to cover in this I2SL workshop will be largely laboratory focused, many of the ideas and principles will be broadly ap applicable to all types of buildings and to deep energy efficiency renovations of all types. Um, now I'd like to ask our partners from the Department of Energy to summarize questions that have been raised during our presentation. And uh, uh, Brian and I will try to cover them. Thank you, Wendell and Brian. And our Q&A is full of questions. So we're excited to be able to dive into additional audience input here. Uh, so we'll transition to that Q&A. If you haven't already, please join us at slido.com and the event code is hashtag DOE to submit and upvote questions. So we'll start off here with moderating these for one of the most popular questions um, about sharing the life cycle and sustainability design standards tool. That link I saw was also included lower down in the questions, but it will also be included in the additional resources page that we send out as well. So folks can obtain this tool um, in some of that follow-up material that will be added to the Better Building Solutions Center. And for the next question I see is, 
the market challenge overall with existing buildings. So I'm wondering, Brian and Wendell, if you could speak to some of the challenges and opportunities that you found with existing buildings. I know this question specifically mentions to new construction, new construction may be doing rather well in comparison. So what your experience has been with those existing buildings? Well, actually with uh, our older existing buildings that went through a complete um, deep energy efficiency retrofit project, they achieved much more energy savings than 50% in, in most cases. So for example, uh, we had a number of um, uh, constant volume buildings um, that had to be converted initially to variable air volume. And those buildings had a lot of costs. I mean, that's a big conversion in itself, going from a constant volume to VAV. And in many cases, several cases, uh, half a dozen at least, we had to do asbestos abatement in those buildings because uh, it, in order to change out those systems, uh, they needed to be, the, the, they, they were built at a time when asbestos was being used in HVAC systems. So all those things were paid for. By, by the energy savings. The energy savings, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the building that had to do all those things and cover a bunch of deferred maintenance that had been accumulating for 50 years, um, it had energy savings of 80%, 80%. It's using one fifth of the energy it used to before that deep energy uh, um, efficiency program. So, um, and that's, that's the best example I think all of our buildings, though, that had to do um, a VAV to constant or constant volume to VAV uh, conversion, um, uh, you had that savings on. Oh, and we had one dual duct building actually that had to be converted to variable air volume. Um, again, the savings were so much greater on those buildings; they were they were well in excess of fifty percent. They they all paid for themselves. And when I say they paid for themselves, I mean not just the co cost of those improvements and and the design, but See, in the background behind all of these uh, uh, precision control systems, there has to be a fault detection system. So the informatics layer now uh, across the campus, we're, we're measuring uh, over 400,000 data points, many of them every five seconds. Uh, and, and that means that um, uh, rather than depending as we did 50 years ago on over designing everything, and that was the margin of safety. Now we have a system that will discover within seconds or minutes a failure of performance in any in any of these systems. And 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 so it's a it's a totally different concept of how, of how you provide safety. And uh, this isn't theory. We've had zero zero airborne exposures in 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 twelve years now of Smart Labs uh, retrofits and new buildings. Zero is a kind of a good number, I think, when it comes to airborne exposures. So, um, yeah, all, all the things I'm talking about, the informatics layer, the, the fault detection system, um, everything is paid for and then some. Definitely, thank you, Wendell. Speaking of some of that design, one of the next questions that seems very popular is, posed as construction contract uh, contractors and designers sometimes want to over design to ensure minimal complaints, issues or follow up after the project. So this person is, is interested in how you suggest overcoming this mindset to design for energy efficiency. I think I'll toss that over to Brian. He's got a lot of experience in, in uh, working with uh, people who have that frame of mind. Yeah, thanks Wendell. You know, Wendell during his portion of the presentation talked about culture. Um, I think culture is, is a huge part of this. Um, you know, we have the data that shows that this kind of approach is effective um, and aligning ourselves with, with designers and engineers that, that um, understand the data and buy into it um, is really key. Um, it's also this culture, you know, I noticed in the question, it talks about complaints and follow up and things like that. You know, it, it's kind of about risk. And if we can de describe our requirements in a performance way, then we find that the uh, design teams, um, the engineering designers, as well as the architects um, are very innovative in their approaches to how to manage um, some of these requirements. And so, 
So often we're not so smart. You know, one of the one of the design disciplines come up, comes across and and comes up with an innovation that we didn't even consider because we're talking about performance rather than being prescriptive. When we're prescriptive, then there's a, a higher uh, risk of of falling short because the dynamics, the variables within any building design, as you know, are are very uh, expansive series of variables, and each building is very different. Um, so, you know, I would align this one mostly to culture, um, but but also this issue of performance-based criteria rather than prescriptive criteria. Um, Wendell, do you have anything to add to that? I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, this is about culture, too. It's about culture and attitudes, and uh, it's not just about technical stuff. It, 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 uh, it, it, you can see that Brian and I are entirely on the same wavelength, and, and the results do speak for themselves. Thank you, Brian and Wendell. Um, as a follow-up, I know we were talking a bit earlier about some of the existing buildings. I'm curious if either of you wanted to, would expand a bit more on any performance of deep retrofits for existing buildings on campus at UC Irvine. Well, um, when, when uh, we started doing this project, um, we thought we would do the whole campus. And, and in fact, we have done the entire campus. And uh, that, that makes sense, actually, um, not only because um, uh, it pays for itself, but also so, there are certain things that we, we did that uh, when you take a broader systems view, uh, a more comprehensive view, uh, that actually improves the whole program. One is uh, uh, exhaust stacks on buildings. So we didn't, we didn't just model, uh, see, when, when we reduced exhaust stack, uh, uh, air discharge, we extended the height of, of some of our exhaust stacks. Um, in fact, one weekend, uh, we, we, with a helicopter, brought in exhaust stack extensions and put, a, put uh, extensions on, uh, I think it was nine or 11 buildings. I forgot the exact number. But, uh, and I thought on Monday morning, and I get a bunch of complaints from people who are saying, you made the exhaust stacks higher. Guess how many complaints I got? Zero. <laughs> And, and by the way, the wind tunnel study that we'd done to determine uh, the, the necessary stack heights um, was done not building by building. It was done for the whole part of the campus where all the science buildings uh, are. And uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was much more rational than, than doing it uh, building by building. So we take this whole systems view of things and um, there, there are results from doing that. And, and um, you know, underlying all of this is, is a sense of responsibility that anyone in a uh, university has, especially a public university. We're spending taxpayer dollars and tuition payer dollars. And, and, and so we, we have to be accountable for this. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, we have to balance that, uh, but it's easy to balance actually with our, our responsibility to improve uh, global climate emissions they're, they're totally aligned in this case and i i would just add you know on the accountability side um students are demanding um accountability uh of you know our energy and sustainability goals incoming freshmen um are asking really tough questions about you know what our sustainability program is and and using it as a differentiator for when they select the university they want to attend. Thank you, Brian Wendell. I think that definitely speaks to the values definitely of, of the student population and their agency and in making those ultimate decisions in their education. Appreciate that. I think the next two questions too are kind of in that spirit of research universities, just wondering more about how you all uh, track savings and how they're calculated from year to year. Um, I know that a question in tandem to below talks about if embodied energy is included in those calculations in terms of the growth of facilities. So um, kind of in that spirit of, of how those calculations are tracked. Well, um, we no, we haven't we haven't really tackled um, embedded energy. Um, or, or embedded carbon yet. 
Now, it is true, though, that um, one of the strong areas uh, of academic research at UC Irvine is material science. And um, I know a lot of those uh, faculty in material science, and they're working very hard on trying to come up with uh, uh, alternative uh, types of materials that have a much lower embedded carbon content. And uh, in fact, uh, in our advanced power and energy uh, program, um, there was recently, I saw a webinar uh, put on by uh, uh, the uh, uh, person who heads up that, uh, uh, that program, Professor Jack Brower. Um, he demonstrated using hydrogen, a complete demonstration project to create green steel using hydrogen as the primary vector. And uh, so research is coming along in that area. And, and we're also tracking uh, carefully um, the, um, uh, the work being done at UCLA. Uh, there's a professor there who has uh, uh, developed a different uh, formula for um, uh, uh, producing concrete, which uh, absorbs CO2. Um, and, and, and over time, uh, actually, uh, concrete does absorb CO2, but this speeds up the, the, the absorption speed by a factor of, I think, about 14, uh, so that uh, uh, it, it will eventually be carbon neutral, but much faster than, than a building uh, that's built with conventional kinds of concrete uh, uh, formulas. So uh, we're tracking all this stuff, and, and, and I think... Uh, um, Advanced timber products, uh, especially products that are being uh, proposed now that uh, uh, will we'll use uh, uh, reclaimed cellulosic waste that is coming from uh, forest management or in some cases from agricultural practices where it used to be burned. Um, we're, we're following all that and the UC system will probably uh, take some steps to put in place a policy that will require that uh, a couple of years out, we, we actually will have to choose for structural materials between uh, green steel, uh, concrete that has uh, a much lower carbon um, uh, content embedded, uh, or maybe advanced uh, cellulosic uh, materials uh, made out of forest waste. So um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit too big of a problem to tackle at a campus level, but as a system, I think we, we will make some progress in that, and, and it'll probably come uh, out of California uh, on a broad scale because we, we uh, have faculty at all the campuses, all the UC campuses are working on this problem right now. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to add, I, I really love this question because we get it from, from incoming students saying, gosh, 21 lead platinums, that's great. What about embodied carbon? Um, and, and it's, you know, a fair and great question. And, and part of it is, um, you know, when we do build, it's for the long term. Um, these buildings will not be torn down and rebuilt, um, which is, you know, one of the greatest offenders in terms of embodied energy. Um, you know, and the premise that Wendell started with is, is you know, build less. Um, now, uh, this, this question uh, refers to, you know, a, a situation where, that UCI finds ourselves in where we are, you know, growing expansively very quickly. Um, and so, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, selection of, of, um, of designs that, for example, have a more balanced site and less, less truck traffic for uh, exporting of soil and things like that. So, um, you know, this is a really great question. And, and really, I think the, you know, the next shoe to drop for, for UCI in terms of our monitoring of our energy use. Definitely. Thank you so much, Brendel, uh, Wendell and Brian. I believe that's the last question we have time to answer. We do have some closing slides here in the last couple minutes. I know Wendell and Brian have also mentioned a willingness in terms of following up, though, on some of those questions. So uh, we can send that out in a resource, just the questions that we weren't able to get to. And we'll, again, offer their contact information here, too, on a final slide that folks can also follow up again with Wendell and Brian. Um, this webinar was our final installment in the 2022 Better Building Summer Webinar Series. We hope that you'll join us for the 2022-2023 webinar series, and those topics will be announced soon on our Better Building Solution Center. Next slide. 
Each year, the DOE also releases an annual report with key findings, updates, and metrics for the Better Buildings Initiative. Please visit the Better Building Solutions Center to explore this progress report for 2022 to learn more about how DOE and partners are working towards a more energy efficient future. There's a lot of great information in there, so I encourage folks to check that out. Next slide. If you're interested in learning more about the topics discussed today, I encourage you to download our additional resources handout from the Zoom chat box. This handout contains links from resources from Better Buildings as well as from our speakers. So that tool that Brian and Wendell spoke about is included in there. We hope that you enjoy and find this helpful. Next slide, great. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists again, Wendell and Brian, for taking the time to join us today and share this fundamental information and impactful practices that have been implemented at UC Irvine. I know the room is flooded with virtual applause. Everyone's very appreciative um, of the time that you all spent here speaking about these initiatives. Feel free to contact our presenters directly with additional questions. If we couldn't get to your question again today, their emails are listed there. I encourage folks to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and Twitter for all the latest news. You can find those handles on the left-hand side of this slide, and you will receive a, an email notice when today's recordings, slides, and transcript are made available on the Better Building Solutions Center. So many reasons to check out the Better Building Solutions Center. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.